what I'm really interested in is the difference between the public ENPs here in the U.S. that still talk about producer discipline, no matter what the oil price, and the private market, which seems to be going gangbusters. You're the guy on the ground, basically. Um, <laughs> do we continue to see discipline in public ENPs and all steam ahead uh, for private guys? Well, I think we'll see opportunistic behavior by private operators, no question about that, and they have the ability to move quickly uh, and take advantage of a supportive oil price, which uh, we expect will continue. Uh, public operators have been very balanced and very disciplined, and, and, and I believe they'll stay that way. I mean, I think they will stay that way into the future, uh, but a better commodity price will allow them to stay disciplined and meet their expectations for their shareholders uh, while growing, you know, modestly. And this mm -hmm. type of sustainable growth is what's the best, I think, for us as Halliburton and for the industry. But that sustainable growth allows us to build capital at a reasonable rate and, and improve pricing and improve performance. So I think that's what the future holds in North America. So, Jeff, in terms of what the oil price, what oil price do you want? And, and I ask that question because if we have 80, we're going to be like, oh, okay, great. These guys are just minting cash. That should come back to you. But then we see a sell-off, 8% in one day, and then it's like, ooh, let's stay capital disciplined and not put a lot of money into the business as much. Um, how do you look at it? Well, I see it a little different right now, and I certainly see it different over the last couple of days. So that's sort of reactionary, but none of that changes our outlook over the next few years. Just because the macro is so strong, meaning demand returns, uh, over time, and clearly it's going to return. Uh, we're at 98 million barrels a day today, and the economy feels more than 2% shut in. So the demand growth is there. Underinvestment, though, has been a feature for the last five or six years internationally. And so mm -hmm. it's going to require a lot of services as we meet global demand for oil and gas. And so that's why you know, the price bouncing around, what's a good price, a supportive price? Is it 60s, 70s? Very good range. I think all of our clients are, you know, successful in that range, and I think that will mm -hmm. allow, uh, you know, our outlook to unfold. So, Jeff, I know that you've been able to retain some pass-through in terms of your cost inflation that you've seen. When do you estimate that you actually start getting pricing power? Let's just start here first in North America. Well, it's a negotiation all of the time. Uh, I would I would say we're we're negotiating up as opposed to down right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a unique set of equipment at Halliburton. So we have uh, the largest inventory or I guess set of uh, ESG friendly equipment and that's sold out completely. And so that's, we're able to, you know, have much more constructive discussions around net pricing uh, for equipment of that nature. Um, you know, and for the rest of the world, you know, that tends to take place as we, see the broader recovery uh, unfold, which you know, there's a bit of COVID disruption in the world today, uh, but as that works out and we see activity uh, pick up, I uh, expect over the next few quarters, we start to see uh, some pricing traction internationally as well. Yeah, I was gonna say, so for international activity, if shale sometimes will be more price responsive, even if they stay disciplined, is international more sticky? Are you seeing longer term investments and how would that compare to say eight years ago? But what we're seeing more so internationally today, I describe them as short cycle barrels. Uh, and so we don't see a lot of the, you know, the 40 year greenfield, multi-billion dollar investment. We see a lot more of producing barrels more quickly. And, uh, and, and I think that we'll see uh, that focused more with national oil companies around the world. Uh, then maybe we would have seen eight years ago, we would have seen a lot of money spent uh, on infrastructure, which today more of that spend is around the well bore, which is much better for Halliburton. That's interesting. Do you feel like you have more pricing power internationally? Uh, I think we will will gain power over time. Uh, you know, I th let's let it play out. I, the um, pricing power returns uh, generally in small, uh, you know, select markets before it becomes broad. Today we see a a very large tender pipeline. We have a lot of opportunity. We see our uh, tool order book filling up, uh, but also the big tenders, large tenders tend to be very, very competitive. But what they also do is they soak up a lot of equipment and capacity. Mm. And for Halliburton, I've been very clear that we are 
focused on profitable growth. And so that means we were making profit and we were growing. And so soaking up capacity internationally, in my view, it helps us in that direction. So if international is going to be more uh, short cycle barrels than in the past, do the super cycle thesis that some are talking about in terms of the big international oil companies are not going to be spending in the same kind of way or they're diverting some of that spending to more green stuff, um, does that create a super cycle in your experience? Well, I think what it does is it creates tightness that requires a lot of services from Halliburton. Um, and so I think that we're going to see a tighter market over time. You know, assets that have been sold were sold to somebody. In fact, there have been a lot of assets change hands, but the assets are still valuable and they're still there. And so as there is a call on those assets, uh, which we believe, uh, I'm very convicted that we will see, um, we will see uh, a lot of demand for all of those assets. Yeah, okay, well, fair, good point. With the assets go somewhere, uh, even if someone's divesting them. Um, okay, yeah, on the call, you, we talked about, you talked about workers, and you said that you've been um, fairly efficient at replacing lost workers. Can you give me some color as to what fairly efficient means? Uh, fairly efficient means uh, successful in re bringing people back. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's 100%, but it's, uh, you know, we have a good safety programs, good work environment, and, you know, it was terrible when we went through last year and, and had to let so many people go. And that's just what we had to do uh, facing what we faced a year ago. But the ability to bring back our technical staff and folks that uh, deliver services at the well site, uh, we have been successful in doing that. Uh, so to that point, do you have to raise uh, wages to do that? And in a totally unrelated industry, but in banking in particular, Deutsche Bank crossing a headline here that they're going to pay junior bankers more in the U.S. We've heard that from a lot of the shops, even like Blackstone, for example. Um, do you have to raise wages? And if so, how much? We, uh, you know, we're in a very competitive industry and we stay at the market. And so, you know, wages, wages will be set, you know, at a competitive level and what we need to do, uh, you know, at this point in time. Um, you know, we, we, we plan for how we manage those things. And, um, uh, uh, but to this point in time, have been effective at managing, uh, sort of all of our costs, including the cost of labor. Um, and we're just very appreciative to have those folks back.